All right, well, these notes are going to get us started in our new Unit 7 packet. We're going to be filling in the first two pages together, and you're going to fill in that last problem and finish that out on your own. That'll be kind of our test to see how well you understood what we we're doing today. So we're going to start off with some basics. And first off, I get asked a whole lot, Mrs. Gunter, what's the difference between a chemical equation and a chemical reaction? And really, they are the same thing. The chemical equation is just the thing that we write down on paper that helps us represent that cool chemical reaction where you're mixing stuff in beakers and maybe feeling some temperature changes or seeing something cool being made. The reaction is the real-life cool stuff you're seeing. The equation is the symbolic representation of that chemical reaction using symbols and formulas from the periodic table to represent those chemicals involved. And there's actually two other words that we need to define here, and it's not going to take much space because these words are the words for the stuff we have before the reaction happens and after. The stuff before our reaction, which we'll always see as the stuff to the left of our arrow or before the arrow, are what we call reactants. And after the arrow, the stuff that is produced or comes out of the chemical reaction is what we call products. And I think we can probably get that defined pretty well just by writing this there. Just make sure that it stands out because you need to be able to use these words as we're talking about these chemical reactions. Now, some other symbols that you're going to be seeing in our chemical reaction, um, and these are going to be important, especially when we're writing out the chemical reaction, and I'm not sure why my arrow is invisible there. But anytime we see an arrow in a reaction, that's where the reaction is really happening. And when we're reading out the word equations and trying to kind of translate them into our chemical equation with their symbols, the words we're going to be looking for that tell us that this reaction is happening is that, you know, the word reacts or yields or produces. That's where the verb um, is happening. Something is reacting and changing into something new. Now, most of the time we are just going to be drawing plain old arrows, but especially if you study from some other kind of resources or you have a tutor someplace, then sometimes you might see some funny stuff written on top of that arrow. And that stuff is never going to be part of our balancing process because it's not a reactant or product. It's not down in the reaction. It's up on the arrow. But it helps us understand some reactions better. If you see a triangle or the word heat on top of a re arrow, that means that that reaction needs heat. Just like some recipes need some heat to actually make that uh, cake come out right. You can't just mix the, per the ingredients together and expect to eat a delicious cake. You've got to add some heat to bake it. The same is true with our reactions. Some of them need heat. So you might see that occasionally. Don't let that change what you're doing with your balancing. And there might also sometimes be substances written on top of the arrow. And those are meaning that our reaction is happening in the presence of those chemicals. But that chemical, just like the heat, isn't a reactant or a product. It's not part of the reaction. And we have a word for these types of chemicals that might need to be part of a reaction but that aren't actually in the reaction. We call those catalysts. Catalysts are like the cheerleaders of the reaction. They help get it going and keep it going, but it's not actually down on the field playing the game. So this MnO2 here is an example of a very common catalyst where it helps the reactants get reacting, helps stabilize and make those products easier and faster, but it's not actually going to be changed during the course of that reaction. Now these next three letters are symbols that tell us a little bit more about the substances that we might have in our reactants or products. This S, L, and G, hopefully you kind of sort of recognize, would be our solids, liquids, and gases. Just telling us what state of matter our substances are in in that chemical reaction. And then this last one is also a state of matter. A, Q represents aqueous substances. And aqueous means that that substance has been dissolved in water. That aqua, aqueous, uh, is hopefully kind of reminding you of agua, water. 
And a lot of reactions that we do are either liquids or aqueous, just because they mix better that way. And it's easier to control the reaction and get it going. But some things, even just like normal table salt, need to be over 500 degrees if I wanted to melt that solid salt into a liquid. And I don't want to have to do a reaction at 500 degrees. That'll hurt me. <laughs> so instead, if I wanted my salt to be liquidy and act like a liquid without having to heat it up to 500 degrees, I can just dissolve it in some water. The water is just kind of there, almost like a spectator um, or almost like a catalyst. It just helps things be liquidy without having to be at such a high temperature. So we can do aqueous reactions at room temperature. And we'll see that happen a lot. So... The reason why chemical equations are so important to us is, like I've been talking about, treating these reactions like recipes. They tell us the amounts of each of our ingredients that we're going to need and how much of our products we're going to be making. So they tell us the amounts of our reactants and products. They also tell us the ratio, and that might seem like basically the same thing, but the difference is kind of the amount is like a set recipe. It says to put two cups of flour in the bowl. But what if you don't have two cups of flour? What if you only have one? So the ratio, this chemical equation, gives us the ratio in case we need to change those amounts, in case we want to do a half recipe or a double recipe of our chemical reactions. So those are pretty similar ideas, but it's important because these ratios are going to let us change the recipe a little bit. And then chemical equations also tell us or show us whether or not a reaction is reversible. For most of this class, you're just going to be writing forward arrows. In fact, I think for the entire class, you're just going to be drawing and using simple forward left to right arrows. But we can have some reactions, and I'm going to try and show you an example of some of these in class, that have double-sided arrows in the middle, which means that this reaction can go either forward or reverse. It does not just go one direction. They are reversible. Another real important basics that we've talked about before are our diatomics, and an easy way to remember those diatomic elements is that silly word Brinkelhoff, or I know some of you liked the uh, saying, I bring clay for our new house. We take those same seven element symbols that are just shoved together in Brinkelhoff. We have to rearrange them a little bit, but then in that new order, we can turn them into kind of a silly sentence that might be a little bit more memorable. So either way, we need to remember these seven special elements and the fact that they are diatomics, which if you remember, means that they never go anywhere alone. These seven elements, like oxygen, when you're breathing oxygen, there's never a single O floating around in your lungs all by itself. Because oxygen is one of our seven diatomics, that means that if it's forced to be on its own, it's going to grab a buddy. It can't handle being completely alone. Other elements like aluminum, not a diatomic, you just write AL. But especially if we're doing and writing out chemical reactions, we need to make sure that the formulas for our elements and compounds turn out right. Be very careful about that. So you will see a question about diatomics on your test. Just a simple, which of these elements is a diatomic or which of these elements isn't a diatomic? So we're going to give you something simple there because it is so important that you remember these, not just for that question, but for writing out the chemical equations, which is going to be what we're going to start doing. You see that the next thing on your page is some steps for writing chemical equations and then balancing them. And I am going to highlight and emphasize a couple of points in all of these directions, and I'd encourage you to kind of highlight them too. Because with all these words here, it can seem kind of complicated, but really... When I tell you to write a chemical equation, all we got to focus on is making sure we have the correct formulas for all of those substances that are named and separate those formulas with plus signs. Uh, now, this is a little bit more complicated than that because coming up with that correct formula can get a little bit weird and complicated. And I'll go through several examples with you when we get to that part. But at the bottom of the page, we're actually going to be starting with pre-written formulas. So we're going to kind of do the rest of this stuff, the steps one and two later. Um, but this is the best place to be writing down this little blue box, um, which is most uh, what I think you need to be able to know or kind of pay attention to in order to be able to write out the correct formulas for our different substances. So um, 
if you're looking at your substances, the most important first step is to see whether you have an element or a compound. Because for elements, we're going to be checking those diatomics, like we just went over. And then depending on what type of compound we have, we're either going to be paying attention to the prefixes in it. Um, like if I have carbon dioxide, then that's CO2. If that was carbon monoxide, with a different prefix there, then I'm going to have a different number of oxygens. Carbon monoxide is just CO. So anytime you have prefixes, even if it's just one in that name, we're just going to follow the prefixes. Anything that doesn't have a prefix on it, if there's another element that does, there's just one of those. And I'll review that more once we get to the writing formulas part of things. If, on the other hand, I have a compound, but I don't have any prefixes in the name. I just have something simple like sodium chloride. Then I need to go and find those elements in their symbol, sure. But I'm going to be checking the charges to see how many sodiums and chlorines will go together into a compound. Because the prefixes are not there to help me. So, get this written down, maybe pause this for a moment if you do need an extra second to finish writing that blue box stuff here. And when you're ready to get started balancing, the process for balancing, like I said, it looks like a whole lot of stuff here, but really when it comes down to it, like in our bell ringer, we just need to count the number of atoms of each element. Very carefully, of course, our goal is for these to be equal on both sides of the reaction, but in the most most cases, they're not going to start equal. We're going to have to make them equal. Now, something that I'll remind you of later, but I would encourage you to highlight here and now, is that when we see a polyatomic ion on both sides of the equation, we can count it and balance it as a single unit instead of breaking it up and balancing each of those elements separately. But I'll remind you of that when we see an example where that'll make a little more sense. So we've counted our atoms, and if they are not equal on both sides, then I need to balance it to get them equal. And we're going to use coefficients in order to balance our chemical equations. And um, I do need you to make one little change here. Um, scratch out the word small. I'm not quite sure when we put that in there, but I've never quite agreed with it. Even just taking it out makes things a lot clearer. Um, I think they might be saying small, like they're not going to be huge numbers, like 5,382. Um, but honestly, when I see the word small, I think physically small. The size is small. But these numbers we're going to be putting in front of substances, like CO2, these are always going to be full-size numbers, like a big 4 here. It's the same size as that capital C. So they're not little numbers, they're not small. And like it says and emphasizes later, one of the most important things is that we cannot change subscripts. So that word small makes me think that we're like adding or changing some of those little small numbers in the formulas, but we can't do that. The only place we're going to be changing anything in order to try and get our formulas and equations balanced is by adding or changing the numbers that go in front of each substance. Those coefficients, the only thing that we can change there. Now, another important note at the end of step four, while in general it doesn't matter which elements we balance, there's two that are going to cause us lots of trouble, and in general I encourage you to leave them till last, and that's oxygen and hydrogen. And there's a rule that you might have heard or learned someplace about this, and you might not have realized that it applies to chemistry, but if we're going to be leaving those H's and O's till last, then we're going to take care of our bros first, because we always take care of our bros before our H's and O's, right? And H's and O's form so many different compounds, they can form so many multiple compounds in the same chemical reaction, they're going to make our balancing a lot more difficult, especially if we make them a priority and balance them first. We've got to take care of our bros first, and then sometimes H's and O's take care of themselves, or at least get easier to deal with after we deal with our bros. So, bros first. It will save you a big old headache if you take care of your bros before your H's and O's. So at this point, we've counted our atoms. Evidently, they weren't equal. So we added a coefficient to try and make them equal. 
And the next step is to recount. Check each atom in that equation to see if it's balanced. If it is, great, you're done. Move on to step six. If it isn't though, you're probably gonna have to go back and change another coefficient and then recount. And then change another coefficient maybe and then recount and keep doing that process of counting and changing those coefficients until the equation is balanced, until I have equal numbers of every atom on both sides of the equation. Now, once we've reached that point, there's always one last step, and it's pretty simple. You need to reduce those coefficients, if possible. You can't always do this, but just like when we cross-dropped and reduced when we were writing chemical formulas, it always needs to be in the lowest possible ratio. So, a couple of quick examples. If I got this equation balanced with 2, 2, 2, 2 all the way across, well, I could probably reduce that down. Since those were all the same, I could make that same ratio a lower ratio by dividing all of those by 2, and then I'd end up with 1, 1, 1, 1. Now, that doesn't happen super often, because most of the time you'd realize if it was balanced to begin with, and it was all 1s. So more likely, you'd have something like 4, 2, 4, 2, where you have different numbers, but they have that same common factor, 2. If we divide 4, 2, 4, 2 by 2, then we get 2, 1, 2, 1. So if you happen to go too, kind of too far, you're not wrong with 4, 2, 4, 2, but it's not quite right, and you won't get full credit for that. So always be on the lookout for any ratios that you can reduce. All right, so I know that seemed like a lot of steps, but I think that you'll get it as soon as we, a little bit better, if this seems like a lot, doing some examples will generally help. So our first example here at the bottom of the page starts <coughs> with Na and Cl separately, making Na and Cl together. Now, I'm going to demo this thing called an H chart for you. Um, and this is something that can maybe help you keep track of the number of atoms you have if you do struggle with balancing, because it's really just about counting and getting things equal, but sometimes it's hard to remember how much of everything you have, especially when we get more elements involved and more compounds where they get more complicated. So this is probably not at the level where you would need to make an H chart. This is one of our simplest examples, but I'm gonna demo this for you here, and I can't make straight lines today. There we go, that's a little better. An H chart will always start by putting a vertical line on either side of the arrow. And you can fill in the elements that are involved in that chemical equation between the two lines and separate them with some horizontal lines in order to give yourself a little space in order to count how many atoms of each type we have on each side of the chemical equation. And this can just be a simple little chart that helps us to keep track of those things while we're counting and changing and counting and changing. So this one is pretty simple to count. I only have one Na here on the reactant side, two Cl's, then one Na and one Cl. So this H chart makes it very clear that at this point, my Na's, my sodium atoms are actually balanced. They're good, they're equal on both sides and I want it to stay that way. But at this point, I'm going to have to make some changes because chlorine is not equal on both sides. So I'm going to have to fix my chlorine. And what this also kind of helps me with is to see where I need to make a change to help make these equal. Without any coefficients filled into these spaces, these numbers that I've just recorded in my H chart are the lowest number of atoms of each type that I'm going to have. I can't make this two into a one by getting rid of this two. That two has to stay there, which means that it's going to have to stay at two. So if I want to get these both sides of my equation equal, then I'm going to have to get more chlorines on that product side. We're always going to be adding more of whatever element is unbalanced to whichever side has less. And we're not really adding them. We're going to be putting a coefficient in one of the spaces on that side. Here I don't really have very many choices. There's only one space to put them in. 
And so at this point, I'm asking myself, what number can I put here that will multiply by the number of CLs I already have, which is one, to give me the number of CLs that I want? And like I said before, this one's pretty simple. If I have one chlorine and I want two, then I'm going to have to put a two up in front of NaCl in order to get that. So that gets me my two chlorines. Just visualize two NaCl's here. I have two chlorines there, but that two doesn't skip over the Na on the way to Cl. If I have two NaCl's, that means I also have two Na's. So it's really important if you're making an H chart that you count things carefully and you make sure to change every element when you add a coefficient, not just the one you were trying to because even though the NAs were balanced and I really didn't want to mess them up, there was no other way for me to get my chlorines balanced. That's the only way I could fix CL, so I have to put that two there, which means that my equation is not balanced. Now I still have NAs to deal with. But just like last time, this way to fix NAs is to get more on the side that has less. So now I'm gonna be jumping over to the reactant side and the only place I could change my number of sodium atoms is with that first blank. And I'm asking myself, what number could I put here to get two NAs on this side? And that's going to be a 2. And luckily, whatever I fill into that space only affects that substance all the way up till that next plus sign and the next coefficient. So this 2 does not affect my chlorines at all. And now I can see that my NAs and my CLs are all balanced, equal numbers on both sides, so I'm done. So I'm going to clean this up just a little bit, because this right here is the absolute minimum that I would need to see in order to be able to give you credit on this. You don't have to do an H chart. This isn't like when you do math problems where I have to see your work. I do expect you to go through this process, but that process looks a little different for everyone. So. Um, this is the absolute minimum I would need to see. The one other way, even if I was doing this in my head, that I would finish this off would be to fill in any blank spaces with ones. Only after I'm sure everything's balanced. Because if I just put a one anywhere I wanted, then I would have put a one in this space first off just because I wanted my NAs to stay at one here. But it couldn't stay there. I would have had to erase that and change it to get my whole equation equal. So... I like to fill in ones because then I have no doubt that I'm done. Um, if I see ones filled into an equation, I'm completely done. If I see an equation with a blank in it, especially if I'm only partially done with one of my practice pages maybe, then I'm not sure if I finished this one or I stopped halfway through, I'm going to have to stop and recount my atoms and check if it's balanced. So to save myself some time and having to double check everything over and over and over again, I fill in ones when I'm done. So that's our first example. On this next example, I'm going to model how I do this without using an H chart. And I'm gonna highlight some things with my little blue highlighter, um, but that's just kind of showing you what I'm looking at as I'm reading this on the page. This isn't anything that I would actually be writing down on my own paper. What I do in general is just read my reactions from left to right, um, look, paying attention to each element individually, and as I see one element on the reactant side, I go and I find that element wherever it is on the product side. So here I have one zinc, there I have one zinc, because they're equal, I don't need to make any changes yet. And I can just go to my next element, ooh, that's an H. I am gonna leave my H's and O's to last, just to kind of model, although it won't make a big difference here. So I'm just gonna go through my elements, I have one chlorine here on the reactant side, and I have two chlorines on the product side. So these are not balanced, and the way to get more chlorines on the reactant side is to put a two here. Now if I do finish things off by balancing my H's, don't forget that two up in front does mean that I have two H's here, and I have two H's over here. So. At this point, all of my elements, all of my atoms are balanced on both sides. I can double check, one zinc, one zinc, two H's, two H's, two CL's, and two CL's. So I'm done, it's balanced, and I can fill in the rest with ones.
You'll notice I'm going down because I think this order actually is the better order to get kind of progressively harder. We went from two elements to three, and now we've got four elements in this example, but we still just take it one element at a time. I've got one K, one K. Great, no changes needed yet. One BR, two BRs. Okay, I'm gonna go back and change this coefficient in front of KBR to be a two, so that that'll get me my two bromine atoms on the reactant side. But remember, that also gets me two Ks. I passed by K, they were balanced already, but now that I put a number here, I realize that I unbalanced my Ks. But it's pretty easy to go ahead and balance them. I had one on the other side, so I can just put a two here now. And I've got two Ks and two BRs on both sides. So moving on, I have one magnesium on the reactant side, one on the product side, excellent. Two chlorines on the reactant side and two chlorines on the product side. So this is balanced. We can fill in with ones. Now, this example, there's a couple of things that I want to point out to you. And first is that I know sometimes parentheses and equations can throw you off when you're counting your atoms. So feel free above or below, wherever is convenient for you, feel free to distribute that number from outside the parentheses in onto each of those elements. Because sometimes just writing it like this can make it easier for you to count and balance equations. This isn't technically the correct formula. I wouldn't want you to write this instead of that if I asked you to write out calcium hydroxide, but just making a little note of it to help you balance might be helpful. So that's one note. The other thing I want to point out is that we do have hydrogens in two places here in our example. And I'm actually going to rewrite this real quick. Okay, just a little bit closer to where it's supposed to be. So I have my H's in two different places on my reactant side of this example, and they are both on the same side. So we can balance them together, and we kind of have to remember to add them together so that we can balance the total number of hydrogen atoms before the reaction, the total number of hydrogen atoms after the reaction. It doesn't matter that they're in two different substances. What we know is that every single atom we started with is still gonna be there after, just in a different order. So I like to kind of highlight them or link them together, kind of like what you've seen me do here, because it helps me remember when I'm counting H's, no matter whether I'm looking at these or looking at those, it helps me kind of remember that those aren't the only H's that I need to be working with there on that side. But let's not start by balancing H's because H's and O's make our life difficult. Even though our calcium bro over here is already balanced, our iodine is not. So we're gonna take care of him before we take care of our H's or our O's. And iodine should be pretty easy to take care of because all I need is a two here in front of HI. And now, H's or O's? Honestly, I'm gonna do H's, but O's might be easier just because they aren't split like they are here. But I wanna show you what I would do if I am working with a split element like these H's, is just count how many I have in each group. I have two H's in that calcium hydroxide and two in our HI. So I have four total H's on this side. And in order to get four total H's on this side, all I need is to put a two in that last space. Like I said, that would and does fix my O's as well because I do have two O's on my reactant side. There's no number up here. So it's just two O's. And then over here, I have two times that one O that I had to begin with. So that is two O's on our product side. So this is finished balanced with one, two, one, two filled in there. Hopefully this hasn't been too bad. I am going to leave you example number four to try on your own. If this is the first time you're doing these notes, um, feel free to send me a message or come ask me in class if you've balanced this correctly. But I wanna check and see if you can do this and just if you know where to start. Cause if you don't, then I wanna work with you to help make this make more sense. Because 
We've been working on this together for half an hour at this point. So if there's anything I haven't been saying right, then I want to say it differently. I want to see where you're struggling to help you get it better. So this is actually where I'm going to stop this video, here at the end of the first page of our packet. The next page is going to go on into word equations, and I'm going to kind of talk over how to write formulas and equations and all of this other stuff that we kind of talked about earlier. So I kind of want to be able to spend that time on that, but if you just needed help with a simple balancing and process there, then you can stop the video here. If not, then you can watch the second video or just continue watching.